today we're going to be continuing on, continuing on in Joshua chapter 15. And I've titled today's message, A Land for Judah. A Land for Judah. Now just quickly to review what I covered last week. Um, because it's going to tie into what we're, we're going to be reading today. After Caleb's request had been granted in the previous chapter, Joshua now returned to the business of dividing the land west of the Jordan among the nine and a half tribes. The first tribe to receive its land portion was the largest of the tribes, the tribe of Judah. And her portion was larger than all the other tribes. I've broken this down into three sections. The first section is going to be that, the, the, how the land was drawn out. And then we're going to be, in the second section I'm going to be reading, is going to be introdu- being, I'm going to introduce you to some new characters. And then we'll get, be getting more specific in the third section as far as some of the cities. So let me get to the first part of our reading this morning. Um, Joshua chapter 15. Joshua chapter 15. All right. Joshua chapter 15, verse 1. The Word of God says, Now the allotment for the tribe of the descendants of Judah by their clans was in the southernmost region, south to the wilderness of Zin, and over to the border of Edom. Their southern border began at the tip of the Dead Sea on the south bay, and went south of the Scorpion's ascent, proceeded to Zin, ascended to the south of Kedesh Barnea, passed Hezron, ascended to Adar, and turned to Karka, it proceeded to Ammon and to the brook of Egypt, and so the border ended at the Mediterranean Sea. This is your southern border. Now, the eastern border was along the Dead Sea to the mouth of the Jordan. The border on the north side was from the bay, was from the bay of the sea at the mouth of the Jordan. It ascended to, the, to Beth Hogla, proceeded north, of Beth Araba, and ascended to the stone of Bohan son of Reuben. Bohan son of Reuben. Then the border ascended to Debir from the valley of Achor, turning north to uh, the Gilgal that is opposite of the ascent, the ascent of Adumim, which is south of the ravine. The border proceeded to the west waters of En Shemesh and ended at En Rogel. From there, the border ascended from, Be- from Ben Hinnom Valley to the southern Jebusite slope, that is Jerusalem, and ascended to the top of the hill that faces Hinnom Valley on the west at the northern end of, the, of Riphium Valley. From the top of the hill, the border curved to the spring of the waters of Nephtoah, went to the cities of Mount Ephraim, and then curved to Bala, that is Kiriath Jerium. The border turned westward, westward from Bala to Mount Seir, went to the northern slope to Mount Jerium, that is Cheslon, descended to Beth Shemesh, and proceeded to Timna. Then the border reached to the slope north of Ekron, curved to, the, to Shekron, to Shikiron, proceeded to Mount Bala, went to Jabernil, ended in the Mediterranean Sea. Now the western border was the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. This was the boundary of the descendants of Judah around their clans. Someone gave me directions. As I followed this, I read this, I would have gotten lost a long time. You got to curve here, you got to ascend here, you got to do all kinds of turns and lefts and rights and uh, just give me, you know, Siri and, you know, let them, let Siri do all the work. But uh, as you can see, there's there's a lot there. And as we continue on with this reading, I'm not a, 
uh, Hebrew scholar. I'm just a Mexican boy from San Diego that is going to be having a hard time pronouncing some of these, uh, some of these names, so just bear with me. Um, uh, and my, uh, my half Spanish, half English accent, my Chicano accent. So, um, but let me, let me break down this first section that I just read. And I, let me repeat some of the things I, I mentioned earlier. After Caleb's request had been granted in the previous chapter, Joshua now returned to the business of dividing the land west of the Jordan among the nine and a half tribes. The first tribe to receive its land portion was the largest of the tribes, the land of Judah, or the tribe of Judah. So again, in these first 12 verses, they clearly describe those boundaries and are way more detailed than what we're going to be reading about with all the other tribes. Now, this isn't surprising given the tribe's importance, their important role later on down the road. You see, it's from this tribe that King David and his descendants were from, and then ultimately the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But its importance is signaled as early as the time of Jacob, who gave a blessing to Judah, his son Judah, that included the promise of kingly authority. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10 says this about Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one whom it belongs the one whom all nations will honor. Now, some maps will show that the land of Judah encompassed this entire area as well. Some of those names are going to be familiar because of events going on right now. But as you can see, they still were surrounded by a lot of enemies. Um... And we'll cover that later on as we go through some of these chapters. But initially, these verses may appear insignificant and at best probably bordering uh, bordering on boredom. And as I studied it, uh, I found it challenging. I was like, man, how am I going to put a a message together with everything that's that's in here? Um, It's just going to fall asleep on me. I'm going to mum- stumble on these words and these names. And, but you also may be thinking, what do these details about borders and boundary lines have to do with the financial, relational, or physical struggles that maybe you're dealing with? That Maybe you're thinking that, man, I'm, this isn't talking to me. This isn't saying anything about what I'm going through right now. But let me tell you this. There is a purpose in these details. If there, if there wasn't a purpose behind them, God would have just left them out. It wouldn't be here. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be here for us to read, for you to read. These territorial, territorial boundaries, you see, are important in the sight of God. And they're rich and are, and are full of rich spiritual blessings or lessons. For example, shows us that land and matter matter to God. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, the Lord says, For I will create new new heavens and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. And in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says this, We wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You kind of see what I'm saying here, church. In the new heavens and new earth, we will dwell in a renewed earth. God doesn't just simply destroy and throw away what he created. 
No. Land and matter matter to God. He's going to make it new. He's going to renew everything. He's going to it's going to be upgraded. Just like what he will do with our bodies at the resurrection. Also in this chapter, God is trying to show each of these tribes that he planned ahead for the acquisition. He wants them to know what it is for them. He wants them to know what is for them is for them. There's no need for jealousy. There's no need for strife. He also doesn't want them to be confused. For confusion will lead to internal strife and fighting. See, they've already fought the enemy on the outside. They must not turn in on themselves and fight one another as if they were the enemy. So here's the thing about this, what I'm saying here. Just as God gives New Testament believers, us Christians, born-again believers, specific gifts to be appreciated, but never doesn't give them to us so that they will create division. And just like that, God gives these nine and a half tribes specific territories with boundaries to distinctively separate each territory. <coughs> if you, each one of you, were to build a house, you all know that it would be of the utmost importance to know the boundary lines of your property. Why is that? So that, obviously, so you won't, so you don't illegally build anything on someone else's property. Or even worse, to have anyone else unlawfully build on your property. That reminds me, my wife and I, we noticed in the back side of our house in the street section, that dirt section that's right from right next to the street. They put some kind of electrical box or something there. I gotta call the city because that's our property. I don't know why they just you know why they just put that there. I know it's not taken care of, there's a bunch of weeds there, but that's still our little dirt property. So um, but yeah, I gotta, you know, if someone builds on your property, like, hey what the what the heck? Hopefully they'll pay us rent for that stuff, right? Um, anyways, um, yeah, you want to know what is your boundary, what is your territory. And the point here is that God created these boundaries, these territories, because they matter to God. They were important to him. He did it for a reason and a purpose. Now, I don't have the time, and, and hopefully one of these Sundays I'll be able to get more into how that relates to, you know, our own borders and, and uh, you know, the territories of nations. Because there is this idea out there that we should live in a world where there are no, border, no borders and, you know, we should get rid of all you know, uh, territorial lines, and um, well, that's not really biblical. But that's, a, that's another lesson for another time. And, you know, there's just so much that could be talked about when it comes to boundaries and territories. We could talk about relational boundaries, boundaries in marriage, boundaries in um, friendships, and relationships with kids, children, um, but again, um, I hope one day I'll be able to get to those topics. The boundaries here are important to the Lord. I don't want to spend too much time on that first section, um, because there's something else I want to get to. 
in this next section we're going to be reading. Now, again, um, this next section we're going to be reading about. More details are given about Caleb's conquest. This conquest of Hebron that was mentioned back in the previous chapter, chapter 14, right towards the end. A little bit more details are given. So if you have your Bibles open still, let's pick up in verse 13. Joshua chapter 15, verse 13. He gave Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the following portion among the descendants of Judah, based on the Lord's instructions to Joshua. Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. (coughs) Anak. Caleb drove out from from there the three sons of Anak. Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. From there he marched against the inhabitants of Debir, which used to be called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, Whoever attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer, I will give my daughter Achash, Achsa, uh, to him as a wife. So Othoniel, Othoniel, son of Caleb's brother, Kenaz, captured it. And Caleb gave his daughter, Achsa, to him as a wife. As a wife. When she arrived, she persuaded Othoniel to ask her father for a field. As she got off her don- donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Give me a blessing, since you have given me this land in the Negev. Negev, give me the springs also. So he gave her the upper and lower springs. Someone wants to beat the entire Russian army, I'll give you my daughter. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's, that's crazy, huh, to, to be, be told that. Um, no, I, I don't mean that. Don't tell my daughter. <laughs> As I mentioned just a bit ago, before I read this passage, these verses shed a little bit more light on how Caleb's, on Caleb's fight for Hebron at the end of chapter 14. Now, first, we learn that Joshua gave Caleb his inheritance at the Lord's command. Strictly speaking, the Bible does not mention this command earlier. But the Lord's words to Moses about Caleb's inheritance do mention it. So it's safe to therefore presume that the Lord's words to Moses were passed on to Joshua as well. Second, we learn from verse 14 that Caleb actually had to drive the Anakites in order, drive, drive them out in order to take possession of the land. Specifically, there are three leaders, Sheshai, Ahiman, and, and Talmai. These three are mentioned in Numbers chapter 13, verse 22, as having been at Hebron when Caleb and the other spies went into the land the first time 40 years earlier. And so there's a certain poetic justice in Caleb now driving them out of the land that he had urged the Israelites to take a generation earlier. In verses 15 through 19, we learn a third thing concerning another city near Hebron, the city of the beer. Verse 15 says that Caleb went up against this city. But as it turned out, his nephew, Othniel, Othniel actually captured the city. And then verse 16 tells us that Caleb offers his daughter, Achesh, as an incentive to whoever captures Kiriath Sefer, that is, the beer. And so we know from the previous chapter that 
Caleb is strong enough still to fight. He says, he tells Joshua, I still, I am still as strong and healthy and vigorous as I was when I was in my 40s. You know, so he can still fight. And so it, it wasn't like, he, you know, he was, he was still strong enough to fight. So it wasn't that he didn't want to fight anymore. More than likely, he was looking for leaders to step up and offered the incentive to see who would rise to the top. Perhaps he also wanted to give others a chance to prove themselves loyal. We know that Othoniel took the challenge and that he met it successfully. So Othoniel took the city, became Caleb's son-in-law, and later on in Judges, in the book of Judges, chapter 3, we know that he became the first judge in Israel. It also seems that Caleb's faith also touched his daughter. For she had the faith to ask her father for a field and then for springs of water to irrigate that land. So then Caleb's example of faith was more valuable to his family than the property that he claimed for them. So again, the lesson here is that the older generation must provide for the next generation, not only materially, materially but also spiritually. Those senior saints, those silver saints, those more mature, older believers, those of you who have been through the grind, who have seen the mountaintops, who have gone through the valleys, through the deserts, through the wilderness, have gone through the storms and have passed those storms and have the entire time have been with Jesus, have trusted with Jesus, and he's guided you through them. You must be examples. You must be examples to newer believers, those new in the faith, in order to encourage them, encourage the younger generation to trust in the Lord and to wholly, fully follow Him. Are you doing that? As a, as a believer today, as a more mature, more seasoned believer, are you encouraging the younger folks, males, females? Are you encouraging that younger generation that it is possible to be in the world today with all the influences going on, all the, all the things that are being influenced with social media, all the, all the junk that's out there in their schools? Are you encourage them that they could still be true followers, that they could still love the Lord, be obedient to the Lord, and not succumb to the pressures. Now, I, those of you who are part of that Generation X, it's part of my generation, you know that we dealt with a lot of peer pressures that were out there. We, you know, everything from when you were a kid to teenagers, even you older generation, you know, you went through some pretty crazy stuff too. But this generation today, they're experiencing something totally different. Completely, I mean, it seems like Satan has churned up the knob 100%. Getting thrown messages from just everywhere influenced by just uh, so many things of the world. Where evil is called good. 
and good is called evil. Pray for your children. Pray for this generation. Disciple them, mentor them, show them they could still be one of a kind. They could still be set aside. They could still be different. Love them. Love them in that way. Don't ignore them. Don't be, oh, you know, they're just kids and you know, they don't have to, they're not going through what I went through. You know, they're just babies. No, they need you more mature Christians. They need you to show them what it means to wholly follow the Lord. This passage also shows us that Caleb was a giver and not one who practiced just grabbing. He was a giver. He produced. He, he wasn't just a consumer. Now, what do I mean? Caleb was satisfied with the gifts God had given him without being jealous of the gifts that God had given Joshua, the leader that had the leader that was chosen to replace Moses. Caleb was not like the two, tri- two, the two Joseph tribes that will be mentioned in chapter 17 who wanted more territorial space than had been given to them. There in chapter 17, verse 14, they asked this, Why did you give us only one tribal allotment as an inheritance? church. Yes, our small church here. We work together as one body in Christ without jealousy or counting and resenting the blessing of others. We must remain focused on Christ and count our own innumerable and unearned Blessings. You may be sitting here, maybe thinking, man, I'm not as blessed as that person that's sitting across the way. But you know what you are. You are more than you know. You're still able to touch the people you love. You're still able to communicate with them. You're still able to embrace them. You're still able to enjoy the beautiful sun. You may not be able, you may not enjoy the cold evenings, the cold nights, but you still can put on a jacket and just enjoy that breeze. Still have food on the table. Think of, I mean, yes, you may not have maybe the the wealth person across the way has or you may not have the same kind of car and the same kind of clothes, shoes and that doesn't matter you are blessed right now, right here you are blessed more than you know you have breath in your lungs you have a heartbeat friends Brothers and sisters in Christ, count your blessings every day. Wake when you wake up in the mornings, instead of complaining and instead of saying, Oh man, I have to go to work, I have to go to school, I have to do this. No, change that mindset. Tell yourself, I get to. I get to go to work. I get to go to school. I get to sit down and have coffee with my loved one. They can all change just like that. Enjoy the blessings you have right now. Focus on Christ and count your blessings. 
Why is that? Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will give living water drawn from the well of the Spirit to all who ask and believe in Him. The Apostle Paul is instructively helpful in guiding believers to interact with fellow believers in their use of spiritual gifts. Gifts are used to glorify God and dynamically and effectively edify others. He writes this, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 6, verse 11, and verse 27. Now, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God works all, works all of them in each person. Let me repeat that. But the same God works all of them in each person. One and the same Spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as He wills. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. So the point is this. Even though we all have different gifts, we all have received the same living water from the same well of the same Spirit. You guys hear that? Let me, that's so beautiful. Let me just repeat that. We, have all, we all have different gifts. We have all received the same living water from the same well of the same Spirit. Thus, my brothers and sisters in Christ, there shouldn't be any room for jealousy in the church of Jesus Christ. There shouldn't be any room for jealousy. I'll wrap this up at the end when I'm done reading this last section. Is this one is going to be lengthy, and as you kind of, if you scan through it already, you can tell I'm going to be probably here for a bit. All right, verse five, uh, chapter 15, verse 20. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the descendants of Judah by their clans. These were the outermost cities of the tribe of the descendants of Judah toward the border of Edom in the Negev. Kabzeel, Eder, Jagur, Kina, Demona, Adada, Kedesh, Hazor, Ithan, Ziph, Telem, Biloth, Hazar, Adath, Adata, Kiriath, Hezron, that is Hazor, Amam, Shema, Molada, Hazargada, Heshman, Beth, Pelet, Hazar, Shual, Beersheba, Bizothia, Bala, Aim, Ezem, Iltolad, Jasil, Horma, Ziklag, Mamana, Sansana, Liboath, Shilam, Ain, and Ramon, 29 cities in all with their settlements in the Judean foothills. Eshtoal, Zora, Ashna, Zanoa, Enganim, Tapua, Inam, Jarmuth, Adullam, Suko, Azeka, Shara, Shar, Shara, Im, Ithium, Gedera, and Gedertholim, fourteen cities with their settlements: Zanan, Hadesha, Mig, Migdal, Gad, Delan, Mizpa, Jok the El, Jok, Jok the El, Lachish, Boskath. Eglon, Cabin, La, La Mam, Chitlish, 
Gedaroth, Beth Dagon, Nama, and Makeda, 16 cities with their settlements. Libna, Ether, Ashan, Ifta, Ashna, Nizib, Kila, Kilia, Ajzib, and Mar Esha, nine cities with their settlements. Ekron with its surrounding villages and settlements. From Ekron to the sea, all their cities near Ashdod with their settlements. Ashdod with its surrounding villages and settlements. Gaza with its surrounding villages and settlements to the brook of Egypt, to the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. In the hill country, Shamir, Jatir, Zoka, Dana, Kiriath, Sana, that is the beer, Anab, Esh, Eshthama, Inam, Goshen, Holon, and Gilo, 11 cities with their settlements, Arab, Duma, Eshen, Janim, Beth, Tapua, Afeka, Humath, Humta, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, and Zior, Zior, nine cities with their settlements. Maon, Carmel, Zif, Juta, Jezreel, Jakud, Jokdam, Zanoa, Cain, Cain, Gibeah, and Timna, ten cities with their settlements. Hal Hal Betzor, Gedor, Gedor, Marath, Beth, Anath, and Eltikon, six cities with their settlements. Kiriath Baal, that is Kiriath Jerium, and Raba, two cities with their settlements. Almost done here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. In the wilderness, Beth, Araba, Midin, Sak Sakaka, Nibshan, the city of salt, and in Gedi, six cities with their settlements. But the descendants of Judah could not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebus Jebusites still live in Jerusalem among the descendants of Judah today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, wow, I'm sweating. <laughs> Woo. All right. Now, some of these cities should be familiar to you if you've read through the Bible and gone through Bible studies. Um, but they should be, some of them should be familiar to us from the study of the patriarchs. Hebron, also called Kiriath Arba, was familiar to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were all buried there, according to Genesis chapter 23. And perhaps this is what made it so precious to the spiritually discerning Caleb. Beersheba means the well, the well of the oath. The patriarch spent much time there. It was a place of renewal, refreshment, and rest. So Judah inherited well over 100 cities and seems to have occupied them with little or no difficulty, with the exception of one, Jerusalem. As verse 63 tells us, Jerusalem was held by the Jebusites and they held it, and they were there for centuries, for a very long time. It wasn't until the time of David that they were finally driven out of Jerusalem. I have a study on that when I went through 2 Samuel. Yeah, it wasn't until much later that they finally were able to drive out those Jebusites from Jerusalem. And it was there that... And it was at that time that Jerusalem was named Jerusalem, the city of David. Let me also point out something interesting. Joshua 15 opens with a positive declaration. 
Now the allotment for the tribe of the descendants of Judah by their clans was in the southernmost region. But it closes at the end of this chapter with a negative admission. But the descendants of Judah could not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. What happened? Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmi, the descendants of Anak. Why? Why then did Israel fail to drive out the Jebusites? The inhabitants of Jerusalem who would be a nemesis to Judah and a source of great pain for centuries. Was it that the men of Judah couldn't? Or that they wouldn't? Was it that they couldn't or that they wouldn't? Was, there, was the failure because a lack of strength or a lack of faith? The specifics aren't really mentioned here. And I'm sure as we go through these chapters, we see, as we go through Judges, we see that there was just a big issue with idolatry, just being really tempted with the gods of these other nations. Who knows? But they couldn't drive them out. But here's the thing. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who came, who came from the line of Caleb and David, would do something far greater than casting the Jebusites out from Jerusalem. Jesus would die outside the gates of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and give himself over to death on Friday. Jesus casts out the power of sin and guilt in the lives of believers through his holy blood. The writer to the Hebrews, to the Hebrews articulates this in the following manner. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate so that he might sanctify the people by his own blood. And then three days later, on a Sunday morning, Jesus would be resurrected by the Spirit. He conquered death and sin conquered sin and death, our greatest enemies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, death has been swallowed up in victory. On that Sunday morning, amen? Jesus' defeat of sin and death provided the water of life for all the members of his body, for you and for me, the church. All believers worldwide, those believers in the continent of Africa, those believers in the continent of Asia, those believers in the Middle East, those believers in Gaza, those believers in Israel, in Syria, in Iran. Yes. He died on the cross and defeated sin and death and provided the water of life for all those, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just those here, but all believers. Everyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Church, know this, believe this. There is an inheritance waiting for you. Right now, at this very moment, there is an inheritance waiting for you to don't give up. 
Don't give up no matter what you're going through right now. Let me share with you what some of the present realities of our inheritance as Christians are. Through faith in Christ, the true heir of Abraham, we outsiders have been lovingly adopted into God's family. Our spiritual adoption entitles us to be co-heirs with Christ himself with full rights to our promised inheritance. Imagine for a moment what this means. Before receiving salvation through Christ, you were nothing but a poor, bedraggled beggar, constantly scourging for scraps to dissatisfy spiritual hunger. You were hopelessly lost and doomed to eternal oblivion as if you were living on some totally other lifeless planet. Now, however, if truly you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have been born again, you live in a fat city. You have a loving, generous Father who has graciously made you a full member of His huge and caring family. He has added your name to the list of His, of his will of legitimate heirs who will receive equal shares of inheritance. That means that your share of the inheritance is going to be the same as mine. Or my inheritance is going to be the same as yours. Equal. In spiritual status, you have risen from the outhouse to the penthouse. That, my friends, my brothers and sisters, it's truly something that we need to praise God about. It truly is something to praise God about. Secondly, to reassure us that a full inheritance share really awaits us. Our Father has even given us a deposit. The Holy Spirit in our hearts. In ancient commercial transactions, deposit des designated a down payment on a purchase. By paying part of the purchase price in advance, the buyer secured his legal claim to the, church, to the item or made a contract valid or made a contract valid and binding. He also accepted the obligation to make further payments or lose his deposit. Same practice, I think, still prevails today, right? I mean, there's still like... I know when I was a kid, it was the, the Kmart thing, right? It was the layaway plans, right? Do they still have layaway plans today? They still have some, some similar things like that? I don't know. I just tell my wife, grab it. I don't know. I don't know if she puts anything on. Huh? The plan. Yeah, the credit plan, right? Credit card plan? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, it still goes on today. Anyone who buys a major purchase on, on, on credit, let's say a house or a car, you know the drill, right? To hold the item while financing is arranged, the seller always requires a deposit. By accepting the deposit, the seller agrees not to raise the purchase price or sell the item to someone else. If that's happened to you, you've been scammed. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pay attention. Again, don't be scammed. 
So by accepting the deposit, the seller agrees not to raise the purchase price or sell the item to someone else. The buyer pays the deposit to confirm the seriousness of his interest and to promise to pay the full balance. So the implication of the metaphor is that by giving us the Holy Spirit now, God has obligated himself to pay us the full inheritance promised to us. Repeat that. The implication of the metaphor is this. By giving us the Holy Spirit right now, God has obligated himself to pay us the full inheritance promised to us. So how do we know that we will get what is coming to us? Well, if you're born again, you now have the Spirit. You now have the Spirit. And guess what? It's part of God Himself. It's not just a Casper the Friendly Ghost kind of a Spirit. No, it's part of God Himself. He's in you. It's a guarantee. As a guarantee. I don't know about you, but I certainly can't think of anything more reassuring to my faith than that. So as believers, we, we must stop. We, 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 we can't keep trying to upend one another trying to be that person. I have more spiritual gifts than you. I have more of an inheritance than you. No, we must stop doing that. We can't. We need to stop trying to upend one another concerning the inheritance of gifts and talents. As I said... Christ Jesus is our inheritance. And the gifts and the talents we receive, that we've been given, even if it's just one. I mean, I sometimes think about it and I think, man, I just have one gift and I'm, I'm going to use it to the fullest. I don't, I, it doesn't, like, I don't care if, you know, you have like a million of the gifts or all the gifts. That's fine. That's, you know, use it to edify the church. Use it to edify one another. And to me, with the one gift that I have, I'm going to use it to, to, to the best of uh, my ability with what God has given me. And I'm just going to share it to edify the church, to lift all of you up, to encourage you. So you should do the same. All of you, if you were born again Christian, have been given a gift. Use it. <coughs> Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will give living water drawn from the well of the Spirit to all who ask and believe in Him. <coughs> so let me close with this one last observation from our passage. Caleb's daughter, Caleb's daughter, Aitza, I hope I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, Aitza, courageously asks her father for a blessing. Springs of water. Centuries later, a Samaritan woman will ask Jesus, for living water. That living water, my friends, is Christ Himself, the only one who can bring us everlasting refreshment. Are you seeking that refreshment this morning? Have you searched everywhere for that everlasting water, for that 
refreshing water of Spirit of God. Well, it's available for it's available to you today. It is. You come to the cross, lay your sins before Jesus, admit you're a sinner, ask him to forgive you of your sins, believe in him, trust in him, surrender your life to him. He will make his home in you and will give you that refreshing water that you've been searching for your entire life. Many of you watching this right now know what I'm talking about. You need it today. You need it right now. You're probably in some foxhole somewhere around the world and stumbled on this YouTube page. Maybe you're, you know, you're about to be kicked out of your house and all you have left is just a few minutes left on your phone before it gets disconnected. I don't have the answers of how you're going to pay those bills. I don't have the answers as far as what's going to happen after you leave that foxhole. But I can tell you this, you can trust in Jesus today and a new life will be given to you. He will give you what you need. He will fill that hole that's in your heart. All you have to do is just believe and trust in him. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're done fighting, you're you're ready to make him your Savior. Wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I come before you now and admit that I'm a sinner. I've blown it. I'm sorry. And I ask you to please forgive me. I now believe that you died and you alone died for my sins. Three days later, you rose from the dead. From this moment forward, I repent of my sins. I turn away from them and confess you and you alone as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now, Jesus, I ask you to fill me with this refreshing water, with the Holy Spirit, so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.